So I saw a very interesting question today on Reddit, and that question was, why do people compile things from source? Specifically software in this case, right? Why do people compile software from source? And I think that this would make a very interesting video because I think a lot of us see others compile software from source and wonder why they would do that, especially when there are reasonable alternatives for that software, things like binaries from the repository or snaps or flat packs or whatever. You can download that software in any number of ways. Why would you bother compiling it from source? So I thought I'd go ahead and make a video trying to explain why people do this. So that's what we're going to do today is talk about five reasons why people compile software from source. But before we jump in, if you'd leave a thumbs up on this video, I'd really appreciate it. It'd really help the channel. So the first reason is the most obvious one is that they have to. And when I mean they have to, I mean it's because that software isn't available in any other way. So there's not a binary, there's not a snap, there's not a flat pack, there's not an app image. It's the only way to get that piece of software is to compile it, and that's what they do. So that's the most obvious reason why you would compile something or compile a piece of software. So, I mean, outside of that obvious reason, what are some of the other reasons why you'd want to do this? Well, the big one really is to give yourself more control over the software itself. And I'm going to break this into two pieces. And one's more general, one's more specific. The first one, the more general one, is just that it allows you to determine how that piece of software is compiled. So in some cases, you can determine what features that software compiles with. So you can have it enable with you know, Wayland support or Xorg support or without Xorg support. And now this is not obviously the case for every piece of software, but a lot of pieces of software will allow you to compile with certain flags to enable certain features. This gives you a lot more control than just using the binary, which is meant for everyone. So that type of control, obviously, is something that is appealing to a lot of people who prefer to be more interactive with the software that they download. So that's the more general one. To get more specific and to go into reason number three is that it allows you to determine where the software is installed to. So there are several different places on your Linux system where software can be installed. Usually it's in one of the paths that are already set on most of your machines or in, you know, on your Linux distro. Sometimes they're in other places and developers can get very creative on where they want to put this thing as long as the system knows where to look for those things. And if you want to have control over where your software is actually being installed to, compiling it is often one of the ways you can have that type of control. So that's the reason number three. The next reason is that it allows people to get the latest versions of something. So the, a good example of this one is Hyperland. So the Hyperland window manager or Wayland compositor, if you want to call it that, is a project that is very well developed. Let's put it that way. It's it's it gets a lot of commits to it every single day. And if you don't want to deal with all that, you probably use the binary version that's in your distro's repository. But if you are more interested in having the latest, greatest version of Hyperland, the best way to do that is to download the Git repository and build it from source. That way you can always have the most recent up-to-date version of Hyperland. And that's that way with a lot of different pieces of software. If you want the most recent version of something, chances are it's not going to be in your repository immediately unless you're using Arch Linux. So you can, if you want the most recent version of something, go get the source code, build it from source, and then you have that most recent version. So that's another reason why people compile from source. The last one is a little weird simply because it doesn't apply to everything. So the reasoning is a little bit odd, but something like, OBS on Arch Linux is in the repository in a certain way. It has certain features that are missing and you don't have access to those things because it's a compiled binary and the people who control that package and put it in the repositories have chosen to compile it in a certain way. If you are interested in having a full featured version of OBS and you don't want to use the flat pack for whatever reason, you have to build OBS from source. That means that you can, you, you can get it from the AUR or whatever. So the last reason on the list is simply that you want to have certain features in that software that isn't built into most of the binaries that are available to you. So again, this is a very rare occurrence probably because most binaries that are compiled are usually compiled from source somewhere along the line. It just means that someone else is doing it, not you. But if they have chosen to compile it in a certain way that doesn't necessarily meet your requirements, compiling it from source will 
bypass that restriction and allow you to have the things that you need to have in that software. It's kind of similar to the Risen number two on this list, but instead of doing it because you just want control, you're kind of being forced to have control because someone else compiled it in a way that doesn't suit your needs, if that makes any sense at all. So those are the five reasons why people compile from source. And I'm going to transition just a little bit to talk about Gentoo because Gentoo is the source distro, right? It's the distro that is source based. Everyone talks about it. You know, if you need to compile Firefox, it's going to take you three hours or something like that or longer, you know, because everything on Gentoo is compiled. Now that statement there is wrong. Not everything on Gentoo is actually compiled. You can get a binary kernel, so you don't have to compile the kernel. You can get binary pieces of all sorts of software. They've actually even created their own repository now that just has binary packages in it. But Gentoo still at its core is a source-based distro. That means you probably, if you're going to use Gentoo, will spend most of your time compiling software. Now, not the majority of your time. What I should say is that when you're dealing with software, you're probably going to want to compile it instead of using the binary versions. And the reason why that is, is because Gen the primary feature of Gentoo is that it allows you to have that control I talked about earlier. You can use things called use flags to customize the software that you install in certain ways. You can make it more lean or you can add more features depending on which piece of software you're talking about. And that gives you full and ultimate control over everything on your computer. And Gentoo is the distro that you'll want to use if the things on this list matter to you. Being able to control what's being installed and how it's being installed, where it's being installed. If you always want the latest version of things, isn't really a good one for Gentoo because they don't always have the latest versions of things. It's not as up to date as it would seem like it always would be, but it still has quite recent software. So you get most of that stuff. And if you want those things, if you want to have that ultimate control, Gentoo is kind of the, the best distro example we have of, of, a, of a distro that kind of caters to that use case. The vast majority of other distros out there are primarily package-based, binary-based distros, meaning that they are going to be using something that is pre-compiled. It comes to you in its compiled form. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't use OpenSUSE or Fedora or Ubuntu or whatever and still build all of your packages from source. You are free to do that. Uh, in fact, I think that would be an interesting experience if you're going to, if you use Ubuntu and then decide to issue every single package manager out there, you know, apt, snaps, flat packs, you just, I don't want to use any of it. I'm going to build everything from source. That'd be an interesting experience to have, but it's not the use case that Ubuntu really is made for. Whereas on Gentoo, that's kind of what it's for. Like it's one of the, the primary features of Gentoo. It's the thing that differentiates itself the most from every other distro out there, the vast majority of other distros. There are other source-based distros out there. So you can, if you're not interested in Gentoo, you can go look for some of those other ones. But the point of all of that is that Gentoo is kind of like the distro where that kind of thing goes on. Whereas on every other distro, it's mostly binary based packages that you're going to be encountering. So the, the I actually should say before I move on that there is one actual exception to that rule. It's not even really a rule because, you know, whatever. But on Arch Linux, the big feature that draws a lot of people to Arch Linux is the AUR. And the AUR really is just a bunch of source code in a repository. Everything there is controlled by package builds, which is a, which is basically a manifesto or a, a rule book or whatever that basically says this is how you build this package, and then you use a AUR helper that will execute on that plan. So it will actually build the stuff from the AUR from source. So a lot of people who use Arch Linux actually do compile a lot of their software because they're using the AUR. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not binaries in the AUR as well. There are. There definitely are. But a lot of the stuff there does come directly from GitHub, which is all the source code. So Arch Linux is kind of like a special case where there, it has um, quite a bit of both. Mostly it's binary, but if you spend time on the AUR, you're going to encounter yourself compiling a lot of stuff. And it's different only in that it has a helper for you to do so. You're not going to have to go, if you want to install something that is written in Rust, you're not going to have to install Cargo or whatever, you know, at least explicitly. It's going to do that, you know, in the background, right? So 
uh, or if you want to do something in Go or if you want to do something in, in, in Python or whatever, you, you aren't going to be interacting with the package compiling tools explicitly. You're going to instead use a, a UR helper that will, will do all that stuff for you. And it's done from the package build manifesto or whatever they call it. So they, so the, so Arch Linux is like a little bit of a special case. It's kind of a mixture of, you know, compiling and binary, which I thought would be interesting to mention. So those are the reasons why people compile things from source. And I think that it's very interesting because compiling from source isn't for everyone, but everyone does have to do it from time to time, or at least most people probably. And I don't want to, I, I could say everyone, but it's not going to be everyone. There's going to be a lot of people out there who's, who've never compiled anything from source in their entire lives and probably never will have to. But if you are the type of person who does experiment with software quite often, if you're always looking for new programs or whatever, chances are you're going to eventually encounter a situation where you do have to compile something from source. And it's probably for one of the reasons that was on this list, either because you had to or because you wanted the control that compiling software from source actually gives you. So I, I, I thought it would be interesting to kind of talk about the reasons why that situation might occur. So that's it for this video. If you have any thoughts on this, you can leave those in the comment section below. I'd love to hear from you. You can follow me on Mastodon or Odyssey. Those links will be in the video description. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube. All of these fine people. You can support me if you want to be one of these fine people at patreon.com slash linuxcast or on YouTube or our Kofi. All those links will be in the video description below if you want to find those things. You can also head on over to the shop, which is available at shop.linuxcast.org. There you'll find all sorts of awesome merchandise available for sale, all the proceeds for which goes directly towards helping me make more Linux content for you guys. So thanks, everybody, for your support. I truly do appreciate it. All these fine and lovely people. Um, uh, I'm definitely not Vanna White. <laughs> Just absolutely not Vanna White. So, <laughs> uh, be that as it may, thank you so very much for your support. I truly do appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for watching. I'll see you next time.